So welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to announce the next speaker and talk. The speaker is David Holton. He specialized in crypto cracking using FPGAs. He has already given talks at the CCC events about the A51 attack, and it's the organizer of the tour camp and tour con in the US. So please give a warm welcome to David Holton. <coughs> the stage you. is yours. All right. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Okay, so I'm here today to talk to all of you about legacy crypto, and more specifically, DES. And um, this may be a little annoying for a lot of you in that uh, all of us thought that DES was dead back in the late 90s, like nobody's going to use this anymore. But it turns out that DES is actually used in lots of different protocols that are still used today. <clears throat> so um, did anybody see the talk I gave in 2012 with Moxie Marlin Spike on cracking MSChat v2? OK, good. So a few people. Um, but I'm just going to do a quick overview of this, because it's kind of part of uh, uh, the background for this talk. So MSChat v2 is basically a way of doing mutual authentication using a password. And it's used in uh, primarily PBTP VPNs and uh, WPA Enterprise. And so if you connected to the wireless network here using you know, the username and password, you were using MSChat v2, which relies on DES. <coughs> And um, another thing is that the research that we did is nothing new. Uh, actually, uh, Bruce Schneier and Mudge and uh, David Wagner published a very similar attack uh, back in the late 90s. And so this attack was known about for you know, almost 13 years up to the point that we, that we presented a practical way of exploiting it. And so um, people knew for you know, over a dozen years that state actors, well-funded organizations, could basically break any of these uh, protocols that, that relied on MSChat v2. And just as a quick overview of how MSChat v2 works, um, you have uh, you know, hello, you get a random server challenge, the client generates a challenge, and then that's kind of uh, hashed together to create your challenge hash. But the, the important part here is that you have uh, this, this challenge hash, which is your known plain text. It's actually sent across in the clear, so both sides can, um, can you know, verify the password. And then, um, then basically use DES to encrypt this challenge hash with uh, essentially the NT hash of the person's password, which is essentially the, the password equivalent. And then uh, that creates a challenge response. It gets sent, sent across. And that's how you verify that the client has the correct password to authenticate to a service. And um, up until this point, people had just tried attacking the user password because obviously, you know, common, most of the time, pa the password is the weakest link in most of these systems. Um, people choose horrible passwords, and um, that's usually the, you know, the fastest way to attack this. And so people would you know, do dictionary attacks and try all the commonly used passwords in order to, to try to break this. And using programs like John the Ripper or Sleep, or um, there's a number of different ones uh, that, that rely on a word list. But if you wanted to um, crack, say, you know, a 255-character password with uppercase and special characters and everything, you're looking at around 92 bits that you would have to brute force, which is, you know, would take a ridiculous amount of time. Whereas um, by attacking the DES operations in this to crack the NT hash, we're looking at, you know, on the order of around 2 to the 56, 2 to the 57 sort of operations. So, um, it, you know, it wasn't until recently that uh, this sort of attack was actually feasible to actually do uh, an attack on DES. And, um, and so this was outlined in the late 90s, and so we thought, oh, why, you know, it should be easy to do this. Um, I built you know, a couple of DES crackers using FPGAs, so we thought, let's, let's try to actually make this a practical attack. And so looking into this some more, um, and one thing that you start to notice is that uh, your NT hash is 128 bits, and a DES key is 56 bits. And so, um, <clears throat> so actually, this NT hash in these first two you know, is the full 2 to the 56. But this one is only a 16-bit key that's being used. It's just zero padded to be, um, to be uh, uh, 56 bits. <clears throat> and uh, when you look certainly at the complexity, yeah, it's you know, 2 to the 57 or so. But because of that 16-bit key, you can basically throw that away. That, you can do that with any sort of uh, computer. You could do it with an Arduino, right? And so, um, so now we looked at attacking the first two keys, which are the full 2 to the 56. And uh, one thing to notice is that they're encrypting the exact same plain text between these two DES operations. 
And so a naive implementation of this is that you crack both keys totally separately, where um, you, know, you go through the whole key space to try to crack one key, and you go through the whole key space to crack the other one. But one nice thing about uh, them using the same plain text for both is that you can go through the key space just one time and just have two compares after you do your does operation to crack both of the keys. And then um, on average, you're going to be cracking both keys in around 70% of the key space. So I mean, you can do the math there. But um, it really comes down to around two to the 56 DES operations to, to break this. And so um, you know, we demonstrated that, yeah, you know, there's a slight optimization where you can do it in two to the 56 instead of the two to the 57 point whatever that, um, that Schneier and Mudge um, pointed out back in the 90s. And um, the other big thing about our talk is that we made it accessible to everybody, so everybody could perform this attack. And, uh, and so how we did this was uh, Moxie Marlin Spike already had this, this service called cloudcracker.com. Had any, anybody heard of Cloudcracker? Um, it was somewhat popular in, in 2012. And so uh, we basically hooked up a bunch of FPGAs in the back end and tied it into cloudcracker.com and published this uh, Python app that would extract um, all of the key material for cracking PPTP uh, VPN exchanges. And then you could just uh, submit a token to Cloudcracker, and then within 24 hours, we would send you the DES key or the, the NT hash. And so uh, then you could use that NT hash to authenticate to the PPTP network, decrypt all the traffic, you know, it basically do uh, all, the, all the different sort of attacks that you would require a password to do. And uh, a lot of you may be thinking, you know, we gave this talk in 2012. Uh, you know, the EFF came out with a DES cracker in 99 or 98. And so shouldn't DES be super easy to crack at this point? And um, so just a, a quick overview, um, the, the EFF DES cracker in 1998 took around 9.2 days to go through the whole key space. And uh, we wanted to get this down to around 24 hours. And so looking at all the available options out there, um, if you used, say, AWS EC2 um, CPU instances, it would take around 80,000 CPU cores and cost uh, you know, on the order of $100,000 or so uh, to crack a DES key in, in that type, sort of time period, assuming that they had those instances available for you to spin up. On GPU instances, uh, you know, it would be around 1,800 GPUs and take around uh, $20,000 in EC2 credits to, to crack a key. And what we offered was uh, $20 to crack a key, and it would you know, return it back in around 24 hours. And this was essentially uh, hardware that we were kind of like doing burn-in testing on with my company uh, because we make FPGA boards. And so, um, so we would just you know, run them through the system to crack DES keys, uh, you know, to, to test them out before we ship them out the door to customers. And then eventually, a lot of this hardware kind of went end of life. Uh, right now, it's a few generations behind. Um, and so now we, can't, we don't really sell them anymore. So it ended up getting kind of migrated into my basement. And, uh, and so now I have this server in my basement that cracks DES in less than 24 hours. And then, you know, of course, after you gave this talk in 2012, everybody rushed to fix everything, right? Right? I mean, of course, everybody fixes everything, right? And so uh, specifically, one of the um, you know, bigger VPN providers that we pointed out specifically in our talk, uh, iPredator, and you know, said, oh, you know, like these, this, this company has you know, many, many customers, and they're vulnerable to this. Uh, their fix was basically to just do a little post on their web page saying that, uh, they recommend that you don't do PPTP VPNs, but you know, they still offered the service, so everybody kept on using it, of course, right? Um, and, then, and then also people kind of dismissed our attacks on WPA Enterprise in that everybody does strong certificate checking. I'm sure all of you have uh, installed the certificate uh, for the, the network for SHA-2017, right? Um, can I get a, see a show of hands of who actually installed the certificate for the network? OK, so a few people. That's good. Um, but uh, you know, in large enterprise environments, uh, enforcing that across all of the different you know, uh, clients and people that are bringing their own devices and connecting to the network is very problematic. And, um, and in a lot of cases, uh, these operating systems don't do very good certificate checking. So anyway, we, we started running the service. And um, almost immediately, I started seeing very interesting jobs pop up. Um, just as an example here, uh, this top line is kind of a standard job. You know, everything's fairly random. Um, but then you look at this one, and like the plain text is one one two two three three four four, and that seems strange for, you know, basically a random uh, SHA one of, of you know a couple challenges. So you know that seemed a little weird. We we're wondering what that was. And then also we got these where both the ciphertexts are exactly the same. And so that you know that's very crazy odds to end up with something like that. And so we're like, what are people using the service for? 
And, uh, and then we started seeing articles of people, you know, using our service for cracking WP Enterprise, which is great. And, um, and then also, this kind of popped up. Uh, has anybody here used uh, the SMB capture module of Metasploit or uh, Responder or anything like that to crack Windows authentication? OK, well, anyway, um, so this is kind of the standard challenge string with uh, Windows authentication that uh, if you're doing Windows authentication man in the middle attacks, uh, most of these tools will just uh, set this as the challenge. And then there's already rainbow tables for attacking the password based on um, you know, captures using this challenge. And so I was like, oh, well, people are obviously using our service for cracking passwords that they aren't able to crack with, with these password-based rainbow tables. And, uh, and so people were obviously using the system for all sorts of other purposes than what we were originally intending it for. And then one day, um, all the traffic kind of dropped off to my server. And uh, Cloud Cracker went down mysteriously. I still have no idea um, what happened to it. But um, since I run Tourcon, I thought maybe we could offer this as a service of, of my conference. And so we started this website called crack.sh, which is basically just a you know, pretty front end uh, to the DES cracking service. And uh, it takes the exact same uh, you know, format as, as the Cloud Cracker system did for, for cracking these jobs. And so um, then you know, I kind of took it upon myself to look into what people were using this for and try to add more features to um, you know, make it uh, applicable to a lot, more, a lot more things. So what features should we add? And, and the really the main point of all this research that we've been doing for you know, six years now is how can we finally kill DES once and for all? And how can we get rid of this legacy algorithm that's been known to be you know, insecure for 20 years now? So um, looking into Windows authentication for Landman and NTLM v1, uh, if, you, if you look at how, how this uh, works, it's actually very similar to MSChap v2. Uh, the only key difference is that your challenge is actually set entirely by the server instead of being hashed with a, with a client challenge. So, um, and I think that this is technically MSChap v1 that, uh, that they're using for Windows authentication. And I, I think that there's still probably other systems out there that use MSChap v1 in which um, you know, this attack works, works great. <coughs> And so, um, so yeah, we saw people you know, using this because um, one of the things with using a rainbow table or using uh, you know, a password-based uh, dictionary attack is that you're attacking the password, but with our service, it works 100% of the time, no matter how complex the user's password is. And so, so yeah, I started talking to people that were doing pen tests, and they were saying, oh, yeah, you know, like, uh, uh, they're, we're trying to crack an account that um, doesn't even have a password set, or you know, uh, it's like a, one of the computer-generated accounts that has a randomly generated 255-character long password. And uh, they're actually able to crack the NT hash and then log in as that user that you aren't really supposed to be able to log in as. And so um, this, was, this was very interesting in that um, a lot of people were thinking that their password security policies were really doing something. But in this case, uh, it didn't really matter um, how, how complex the passwords were. And so, um, so we ended up adding in some support where you can basically copy and paste in from SMB Capture directly into the website. And then for $20, you know, we would send you the key. And, uh, and then you could log in as that user on the network. And, uh, and then also, in, in the meantime, uh, this program called Responder came out, which is basically um, a way of doing Windows authentication man in the middle. And so uh, if you fire up Responder, if it uh, it looks for any sort of NetBIOS name resolution requests, and then it basically re just resolves them to the attacker server. And then you can do downgrade attacks to downgrade them to Landman or NTLM v1, do the full um, you know, MSChap v1 authentication. And then um, the result is that you end up getting this, this uh, response value that then you can feed into John the Ripper or feed into our website and crack the key based on that. And so. Um, so with a lot of networks, especially ones that have you know, some older devices on them that require Landman or NTLM v1, um, you, know, you fire this up on the network, and you're going to be getting just millions and millions of you know, devices responding to you that are just you know, automatically trying to connect to different you know, um, file shares and authenticate on the network. <coughs> and, uh, and then also with WPA2 Enterprise, uh, since then, there's been, uh, they've come out with host APD WPE, which is uh, basically a a host AP um, uh, a server that you can run on, on your device. And then it essentially uh, you know, fakes a, a base station, people connect to it, and then it gives you a nice hash that you can crack with John the Ripper or feed into our website. And then um, the resulting NT hash that you get from our server, um, 
you can authenticate with to the network. So now you can log into the, to the you know, enterprise network and, um, and do it without even knowing the person's password because you have the hash of their password. <coughs> And then also, um, in the meantime, uh, Karsten Noll gave a talk uh, back in 2013 about uh, do cracking over there updates to SIM cards. Um, so in most SIM cards, there's actually like a you know, full Java virtual machine that um, supports all sorts of different things. And uh, currently, you know, uh, the, your carrier can send uh, remote updates to your phone and uh, update your SIM card firmware and then do all sorts of things like you know, listening to your phone calls or you know, uh, scary things like that, and so he demonstrated that a lot of these uh, cards are actually secured with single DES, and, um, and basically you know, outlined how you could use a service like CloudCracker or Crack.sh to crack these over-the-air update keys and then uh, you know, install all sorts of uh, nasty malware into people's SIM cards. And, uh, and then also, if anybody here watches Mr. Robot, this was featured on Mr. Robot in Season 2, Episode 9. <coughs> so uh, we, we also wanted to make it so that any sort of other weird protocols, like um, lots of uh, uh, radio protocols use DES still, um, lots of satellite protocols, uh, et cetera. Um, we want to make it so anybody could use a service to crack anything, anything that uses DES. So we decided to create a general purpose um, interface where you just kind of provide uh, the parts of the plain text that you know and parts of the cipher text that you know. And, you can, um, and then we basically run it through the FPGAs and send you a list of all the possible keys that meet that criteria. And then you can do further checking on it um, later on with software. And so we have you know, basically just a simple kind of, uh, you know, we do the DES operation and then apply a mask and do a compare. And all this is up on GitHub if you want to um, try to uh, crack something that you found. <coughs> And so after I put together this interface, I wanted to you know, just show, create an ex example app for this. And um, some of my friends had worked on uh, some Kerberos attacks. And they had mentioned that they'd come across a lot of networks that still use or support doing DES Kerberos authentication. And, um, and this, was, you know, this is stuff that was supported back, I think, pre-Windows 2003. But a lot of networks still have legacy machines on them that require this to be enabled. And so, um, so I thought, oh, you know, this should be fun. I'll try to crack Des Kerberos. And so um, there's all sorts of uh, different parts of the protocol that you can use to crack the Des key. And, um, but the, the key part is you have to be able to get uh, you know, a network capture of them actually authenticating and you know, getting tickets and stuff like that using Des. And so uh, I just put together a simple editor cap filter that substitutes basically any supported encryption type uh, with uh, does CBC CRC, so um, so now uh, you know man in middles uh, you know a connection and then says oh we only support does CBC the client connects to the server and um, and now they're going to be you know uh, communicating just using does and then uh, because the whole protocol uses ASN one there's all sorts of uh, plain text that's basically fixed just as part of uh, you know the headers in ASN one um, that pretty much are always there. And, uh, and then because of how CBC works, we can uh, basically attack any block in the whole um, you know, message that's encrypted with DES uh, to figure out the key. So it's only a matter of you know, looking through the SN1 and figuring out where it lines up with, uh, with static values to, to figure out um, how to extract known plain text and you know, your ciphertext to create a token to submit to the website. And, um, and the reason why this, this works is basically because um, with CBC, um, it, Basically, the part of the cipher block chaining is that you have um, the cipher text of the previous block that gets XORed with your plain text, and so both of those values are known, and so then you can you know, use that to crack basically any block within the chain. <coughs> so um, also on GitHub, uh, you can take this uh, you know, Python script and point it at a PCAP file, and uh, if it's using DESCBC, it'll you know, automatically figure out the known plain text and create a submission token that you can submit to the website and crack the, the DES key for it. <clears throat> and then, of course, you know, this works no matter how complex the person's password is because we're actually attacking the underlying protocol and not the password. And so um, another interesting thing that came up is that I started receiving people asking, uh, people, emails from people asking if I could crack uh, DES crypt. And does anybody remember uh, back when your you know, password file had, uh, had a hash in it that had, you know, was a DES uh, crypt password. Yeah, I mean, like, nowadays, nothing supports it, right? And so why are these people trying to crack DES crypt hashes, right? 
Um, and so I started looking around, and um, I guess that Descrypt was, uh, it's basically 25 rounds of Des uh, to hash the password. And, um, and then they add in some salt to mix it, you know, mess up the S boxes to, to salt it. But it was originally designed so that running on a PDP-11, it would take you know, over a second to compute a, a password. And so obviously, it's a bit faster nowadays. But nobody uses this anymore, right? Right? So it turns out that Qnix um, you, still uses uh, DES. I think that they actually support two different types. They either support Descrypt or their own proprietary one that's fully reversible. So Descrypt is actually the most secure option that they support. And um, I found this press release from them from two years ago saying that they're in 50 million vehicles. And I'm sure that they're in way more. Um, basically, a lot of the infotainment systems use Qnix. And so um, if you look at a lot of these talks that people are giving on, on car hacking, um, for example, uh, this one right here is from the Charlie Miller Jeep hack uh, from, from his white paper. And there's the password file with the, with the Descrypt hash in it. Um, this is another talk that I found that uh, you know, they just showed the, pass the shadow file. Um, from a, from a Unix uh, you know, system running in, a, in a, uh, a vehicle somewhere. And then you know, searching around online, you just find all these forums of people asking people to crack their Des crypt hashes. So, um, so it's like, OK, maybe there's, there's uh, something to this. And so I implemented um, you know, an FPGA core uh, and support for the service to crack these. And uh, you know, just runs through the whole, key, whole entire key space. So we can guarantee that it cracks the password 100% of the time. And, um, and this is. Basically, you know, all uh, 90, 95 possible characters, including nulls and stuff. So 96 uh, to the power of 8, and then times 25 rounds of DES. And so it takes around three days for, for the system to brute force it all. And so I thought, oh, I'm just going to you know, own all the things. I'm going to get all these cool passwords. And um, so you, know, you can take any of these, plug it into the system, wait three days. And uh, you know, I, I'm definitely going to find some really secure passwords using this method, right? <laughs> you, may, you may sense a recurring theme in this talk. Um, so I even had a friend, uh, I was like, OK, give me, give me the best password file that you have. And, and uh, he's like, oh, I, I just like, opened up um, uh, one of these OnStar systems that's basically in every, you know, uh, any, every vehicle that has OnStar. And I got the shadow file off of it. So here you go. Try, try cracking this. I'm sure it's really tough. And it turns out that it's just root. The root password for OnStar is root. Um, so the, the G pack, it's DT donkey. For this other one, it's like VUI. It's all just lowercase alpha. You know, like I could have just cracked this with John the Ripper in, you know, in a day or whatever on, a, on my Arduino. So I, I, I'm very pissed off at this point. So if anybody here has any sort of these hashes that might be difficult to crack, please let me know, because I wasted a lot of time implementing this to go through the whole key space. And I really want it to work on something that's, that's difficult to crack. So that's kind of how I feel. <clears throat> um, but anyway, so uh, the API uh, for, for just cracking arbitrary does stuff is up online. Um, you can check it out on GitHub. And, um, <clears throat> and then you know, we basically send you a, like a gzip text file with a list of all the keys, so you can, you can try all of those. And uh, the, the real thing you know, is like we're trying to fix this somehow. And, um, and so I like to use this one example of, of ways to fix things in, uh, as far as security. So uh, does anybody here remember session hijacking, being able to steal cookies uh, you know, over unencrypted uh, you know, web sessions and stuff? So uh, does anybody here remember Firesheep, the Firefox plugin? Yeah, yeah. So that, that got a lot of press. And so you know, it, we knew about session hijacking for a good half a decade. And, um, and all of these services, you know, like uh, Facebook and Amazon and like all these major websites uh, never fixed it. They were like, oh, it's not an issue. Uh, you know, only these wily hackers know how to do this. But then it took uh, you know, a couple of people making a Firefox plugin that made it so you go on any public Wi-Fi and you see a list of all the sessions out there. You can just click on them and log into someone's Facebook account. It took that for suddenly, you know, within a month or two, Facebook does you know, SSL across everything. You know, Amazon does SSL across everything. All, all these websites now are fully SSL secured. And so, um, so this is kind of like uh, you know the essentially what our project is trying to do is uh, slowly but surely make it easier for everybody to do this sort of attack uh, in order to get this finally phased out. And it seems like an impossible task to kill a legacy crypto algorithm, but that's kind of our goal at this point. So, 
So then we started asking ourselves, like, how do we actually motivate this change more than just having a service out there that costs $20? And um, the biggest problem with the service is that you know, it's, it's a, you know, a system with 48 FPGAs. It costs a lot to power it. And the biggest part is that we need to have some sort of form of rate limiting so that people don't abuse the service. And so that's why we charge the $20. And, um, <clears throat> and so we asked ourselves, what if we could make the service free? And so going down that rabbit hole, we were like, OK, well, so to make it free, uh, we have to make it fast enough so that you know, we don't have to care too much about rate limiting or you know, we, can, we can deal with it. And uh, we have to make it so you know, it draws less power and all that sort of stuff. And so the obvious solution is uh, maybe we can make a rainbow table of this. And um, the, the main issue when you look at making rainbow tables, uh, especially of this size, is that it's a very large key space. Um, just for reference, like the largest off-crack table is um, around 2 to the 52 and a half. And you know, we were looking at doing 2 to the 56, um, which is you know, about 10 times bigger than the largest uh, password rainbow table out there. And, um, and then also, one thing with DES is that uh, you know, it's a block cipher, so we have plain text that we have to take into the equation. So <clears throat> um, our, our, basically, our design goal was to make it so that it was just for a specific plain text. And so, of course, we chose the 11223344, which um, we could use to attack Windows authentication. And, um, and then we also wanted to make it have a really high success rate, because um, you know, we, we wanted this to be a service that was very reliable. And, um, and especially because we're doing cracking two DES keys, you know, the lower the, uh, the success rate, then the higher you know, um, chance of us not being able to crack you know, two keys, and we only crack one, and that, then it's not really worth it. So, um, and then the other thing is we wanted to make it as fast as possible so it could be close to real time. Um, and uh, so you know, it just becomes that much more easier for people to use. So um, the hardware that I just had uh, available, um, I, I was like, OK, well, I could, I could easily afford six terabytes of NVMe drives because they're super fast. And, um, and then I could also borrow some uh, you know, high-end FPGAs for my work. So these are being uh, borrowed for now. And uh, you know, I can borrow a server. And so you know, it, it doesn't, doesn't cost that much to, to put this together. And so I came up with some parameters. Um, the chain length is around half a million uh, links per chain. And then um, you know, around uh, 275 billion chains per table. I was like, OK, we'll have three tables. And then this will get us a crack time of under three seconds. That sounds great. Let's do that. <coughs> and so uh, to, then I had to generate the tables. And so I managed to borrow some hardware. Um, I managed to borrow like 48 FPGAs. Um, they're pretty high end. And so I was like, woo, let's get going here. And uh, you know, put together a design and used um, a bunch of techniques that we figured out with putting together the first DES cracker. Um, one of the main ones is that with uh, large FPGAs, uh, you end up having lots of routing issues. And so um, most of our designs nowadays just have a really, really narrow bus that we use to connect all these different cores together. And then um, essentially place and route it just for individual regions on the FPGA. So each one of these squares over here are individual clock regions. And then, um, then we just kind of chain them together in a way that we can uh, you know, just um, essentially kind of create a ring um, for passing data between all the cores. And then uh, it makes it so we can clock it faster and, um, and you know, just uh, make a use of more of the FPGA. And um, it's just a lot more efficient to do it that way. Um, so anyway, got the core going, got the hardware, started running it. And then, of course, there's hardware problems. You know, anytime you deal with hardware, um, you know, running 48 FP FPGAs of, these, of this size in, a, in one system obviously creates lots of uh, overheating issues. So had to deal with that. Um, also, turns out turning on you know like uh, over 100 DES cores in an instant, uh, power supplies don't like that for some reason. Um, you know, just like immediately going from drawing two amps to drawing like 40 or 50 amps, um, lots of power supplies don't like that. So we had to refactor a bunch of things. Uh, you know, fix a bunch of issues. And eventually, we got it fixed. <coughs> and um, finally got some tables back that we could check. And unfortunately, there was a really high collision rate. So then uh, it basically meant that the tables that we spent you know, a few weeks building were unusable. But we learned a lot of lessons. And so um, came up with some new parameters. Basically, because of the collisions, we had to pare down um, our ambitions a little bit. So we went to 12 tables instead of three. 
and, um, and then that kind of increased our crack time to closer to 12 seconds, <clears throat> which is still, still reasonable, I think. So um, then more, more issues, you know, like the hardware that we borrowed ended up having to actually go out to customers for some reason. And so, <laughs> so we ended up having to return some and then, um, you know, spend a few more weeks generating tables. And now we have our cracking system up. So this is uh, a system. It has six FPGAs, and these are the NVMe drives. Um, they're just like the tiny little M2 laptop ones and PCIe adapters. And then um, just to channel all of the air over to the FPGAs to keep them cool, I just put in some foam uh, to channel the air. So it's um, very, very high end here. <coughs> and, uh, and then it turned out that our coverage was better than expected. Right now, we're at about 99.65% success rate. And um, because ideally we would have uh, 12 FPGAs, but because we have six, we do like the first half of the tables on six and then do the second half. And so 92% uh, of the time, uh, it'll crack the key in under 12 seconds. And then, um, and then you know, if it doesn't crack it, then, then it'll take another 12 seconds. Um, and so for two keys, our total success rate is still over 99%. And um, you know, most of the time, it'll take less than 24 seconds, which is pretty quick. <coughs> So anyway, um, it's free. Anybody can go to crack.sh and uh, submit jobs, and it'll uh, crack des keys with this plain text uh, you know, within a matter of seconds. So uh, I thought I'd just do a quick demo um, so you guys can kind of see one of the practical applications of this. Um, might just be kind of useful, since uh, a lot of you, it sounds like, haven't used Responder before. <coughs> so let's see here. Oh. All right. So I have uh, Kali Linux running on the left here. For some reason, my video is uh, acting a little weird, but yeah, I will. Okay. Uh, so um, let's try firing up Responder. So now this is, uh, you know, on on the internal network between the Windows host and uh, and Kali Linux, and this is the same as you know having. Uh, you know, laptop running Kali Linux just plugged into a corporate network. And now whenever any machine that's running Windows on the network, you know, goes to any file share or whatever, it's basically, uh, it doesn't matter what the file share's name is, it's going to respond to basically everything on the network. Um, now, so it just captured, um, you know, sent out that 11223344 challenge and got response back here. So now we can take this response and... Um, <coughs> Go over to crack.sh and just uh, type an NT hash and paste it in here. Oops. Oh, here. Uh, and now, you know, just type in your email address. And uh, I didn't want to do this on the network for various reasons, and so I kind of had this pre canned. But basically, within, you know, most of the time, within 24 seconds, you'll receive the NT hash for that user in an email. And we also have an API if you want to just automatically build this into Responder or any of your tools. So now um, this is essentially the password equivalent for, for that user. And then if we switch back over to here, we can do um, something like SMB client um, and tell it that we're going to give it the NT hash instead of the password. Um, oh, wait. And then just paste in the NT hash. And now you know we're on the, on the system. <laughs> and, um, and then also, uh, I assume some people here use Metasploit or PSExec or, okay, so, um, so there's also this uh, cool feature in uh, Metasploit. You can also, there's a bunch of different tools that do this, but um, it's basically a way to get a shell on the system um, using, uh, using an NT hash. So you can, um, you know, there's a bunch of different modules for doing stuff like this, but um, I'm just going to show the uh, PS exec module. <coughs> so, uh, so we're going to um, basically tell it to call back to us with a shell. Uh, and, uh, and then our Samba password is just our hash here. Uh, user client, and uh, I tell it to exploit. So now it's connecting, uh, authenticating with the server. 
uh, or, or with the, you know, the Windows machine over here, using that, that uh, NT hash. And then um, we can just say, oh, I want a shell. And now you know, I'm running as a system on there, and um, you can do basically any sort of commands um, on the system <coughs> as that user. So then you can install backdoors or you know, whatever nefarious things you want to do. <coughs> so um, anyway, that's uh, <laughs> the quick demo of Responder using this. And, uh, and yeah, uh, another, just to hammer this in a little bit more, you know, it doesn't matter how complex the user's password is. It doesn't matter even if the user you know, set a password, if it's you know, a computer user or something like that. Um, this attack works for that 100% of the time within around 25 seconds. So, um, so if we look at this in the scheme of Moore's law, you know we have the EFF Des Cracker that came out in around '98-ish, and uh, you know took about 9.2 days to go through the whole key space. And now, fast forward about 13 bits in the future, you know 20 years, um, we're looking at uh, you know in theory, if Moore's law holds true, for you know if the EFF did the same sort of thing today they'd be able to crack any DES key with any plain text and all that within around 97 seconds. Um, and you, know, you could scale that, obviously, to well-funded organizations and governments that have you know, a few million to throw at this to get it done in a matter of you know, uh, you know, less than 10 seconds. So, um, so I guess uh, you know, with these legacy crypto algorithms, we're going to be seeing this more and more prevalent over you know, the next few decades of uh, Moore's Law catching up to these. And, uh, and then also another thing in the mix is that now, you know, especially with time memory trade-offs and rainbow tables, you know, with uh, somewhere around $20,000, we're able to crack DES keys in 12 seconds, uh, especially with uh, all this new uh, cool you know, uh, NVMe technology. There's other sorts of storage technology that's coming out um, that's just going to make uh, these sorts of attacks even faster. Um, so. Um, so yeah, this is a, a really big issue. How do we get legacy crypto to be phased out? And we're trying this method right now, and we'll see if it works. Um, but uh, we really need help from everybody. So we have an API uh, that you can use to integrate uh, the service into any of your applications. We'll probably be coming out with one that goes directly into Responder that will just automatically you know, reverse it to an NT hash. Um, somebody already put together an AirBot plugin so you can connect it to Slack or IRC if you want to submit jobs to, to the system over IRC or something. Should be kind of funny. Um, and then uh, if you want to run it yourself, we put all the code uh, up on GitHub. It's all open source. Um, so uh, the, the SDES RTOP is the actual software that um, kind of uh, does all the lookups and runs stuff uh, on the FPGAs. And then uh, this is actually the FPGA project, the DES RT FPGA. And it's a Vivado project that you can build for, for any FPGA. Um, <clears throat> we also, uh, thanks to the NOC team and also uh, Yolocation, we managed to uh, get a copy of the six terabytes of tables up on the network. And, um, and so if you go to uh, either of these websites, you can start downloading them. And we're also trying to figure out the best way of getting it out to you know, be mirrored and uh, torrented and all that sort of stuff. So if anybody has any ideas or happens to run their own mirror for open source projects and can spare six terabytes or can leave this conference with six terabytes of drives, um, come see me after the talk. <coughs> and, um, and then obviously, there's, uh, you know, this, all this stuff is built on uh, the shoulders of giants. So there's um, tons of research that uh, you know, it's kind of the precursor to all of this. Um, you know, my talk with Moxie and Marsh a while ago. Um, uh, Ian Foster gave a talk earlier today. Uh, helped with some of the host AP stuff that I was working on. And, um, and then, again, special thanks to, uh, to protagonists in the NOC and uh, Yolocation for, for helping get the stuff uh, went online when I approached them basically yesterday afternoon and asked them if they could help me uh, get these tables up so people can download them. So um, anyway, uh, help me kill legacy crypto. And if anybody wants to run free jobs, once again, you know, this is just a, a method of, um, of you know, uh, making sure the system isn't abused. So just email me if you have any interesting research ideas. Um, everything's online. And, uh, and then also, this whole thing is you know, basically all the money that this uh, generates goes directly toward running uh, our TourCon events. And so, uh, our next TourCon event that we have coming up is in San Diego at uh, the beginning of next month. And, um, and then we also, have, uh, we also run the US hacker camp called TourCamp. 
and that's going on next summer. So um, just as an extremely shameless plug uh, for tour camp, um, it's a lot of fun. We're out on uh, one of the islands in Washington, and um, there's uh, people bring, you know, pay phones and lasers, and same stuff that you see here. So if you want to come party with some of the, the American hackers, um, don't forget to add that to your calendar. So thanks a lot for your time. <clears throat> Thank you very much, David. And we have plenty of time for questions. The microphones are open. If you have any questions, just queue in front of the mic. Crickets. <laughs> OK, we have a first question. <laughs> um, do you have any numbers on um, how long it takes, how expensive it is to run this on um, EC2 F1 uh, instances? Oh, yeah. Like yeah, so, um, so yeah, there, there's Amazon F1 instances that came out recently. And, um, and yeah, I was on their beta program and played around with it a little bit. Um, it looked like, based on their pricing, uh, it, would, it would still cost like over $100 to crack a disk key, like $110 or $20, I think, is what I calculated. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're probably going to eventually migrate over to that. Um, but um, hopefully, the pricing will be a little bit better. Um, or maybe we could just add it as an option if somebody you know, just wants to, you know, uh, we could provide an AMI or something if somebody just wants to pay it out of their pocket to, to run it on there. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> More questions from the audience. <laughs> It seems like you've done DES pretty much as thoroughly as can be done. <laughs> so what's next? <laughs> um, well, so, so I've done some research on, uh, on automotive, uh, like immobilizer algorithms, like HiTag2 and DST40 and AD and stuff like that. And so I mean, there's lots of low-hanging fruit in, in that sort of, uh, you know, the RFID crypto uh, stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, basically anything less than 80 bits is probably something that, that we could, you know, look into. Um, but yeah, it'll be a while before we can attack anything, you know, much higher than that. Uh, but if anybody has any ideas, uh, please let me know. <laughs> uh, so you basically already answered this one, but uh, mm -hmm. triple DES or double DES, basically, the oh, uh -huh. two take keys, that's way out of reach still, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, maybe once, yeah, storage and, uh, you know, the being able to do meet in the middle attacks and stuff like that is a lot more feasible than we'll be able to do that. But yeah, for now, it's, it's kind of, uh, I mean, uh, for, for me, like uh, practical attacks are things that we could do, you know, in under 24 hours. Um, because then if, if it takes longer than that, then it's not really going to be, you know, that, that useful to, to most people. Uh, and so I think it'll be a while before that's a reality. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, for now, for now, triple does is safe for people like us, at least. <laughs> Any more questions? OK, well, um, if anybody wants to chat more about this or wants to help spread the tables, then um, please come and see me after. Um, I'll probably be just right over here for now. So uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. <laughs>